esto. Hello, Carlson. Here. So the three most important people are here: the organizer, the speaker, and the host. <laughs> but I understand right that this is no. There are thirty participants, so everything is. We are being recorded actually. Okay, we have thirty participants. Okay, thirty-one now. Yeah, that's much better. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Dirk. Nice to meet you. Hi, Claudia. Nice to meet you. Thanks for organizing this. No, but thank you for coming. Um, sure, sure. It is a strange period. We wanted to resume the activities, and I'm happy that you uh, were willing to take part even in this form. We will have another version. Sure, sure. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. No, I'm happy. Thanks for your interest. No, please. It, it was very interesting that this takes place. So, Thorsten, I think that you will introduce Dirk then. <clears throat> it's one minute to go. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I have a Swiss passport now, I don't start before. Okay. So you're <laughs> truly Swiss now, not only Swiss by heart, but true right. Swiss. Good. Are you in Gerzensee or at home? Or? No, I'm in, ho I'm in the home office. In the home office. Because mm -hmm. today and yesterday was the SFI research days in Gerzensee. Yeah, well, supposedly, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> it's a pity, it's such a great place. Yeah, yeah. We have many, many, many courses that we had to. I mean, most of them we just cancelled, and a few are online, but most of it is cancelled. Hmm. So, Claudio, this will be recorded. It is being recorded now, so everything that we spoke was public. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is fine for you, Dirk. Yeah, we discussed this. That's fine. It's really easy. Fine, absolutely. It is obviously up to. But basically, if we want to, let's say it is very good to have these materials available for people who cannot attend now. And now we have, we are fifty three attendees already. So okay, then I <clears throat> then I'll start. Huh? Yes, please. Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce Dirk Nippelt. He is professor at the University of Bern and the director of the study center Gerzensee. He has a doctorate from HSG in St. Gallen and also a PhD from MIT. He's a member in most important societies like the Swiss Society of Economic Statistics and CPR, SSE for Verein für Sozialpolitik and the <clears throat> also a deputy member of the Economics Committee of the Canton of Bern. So he's a specialist in monetary economics. He has published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics in the Journal of Monetary Economics, and he knows also what is going on in the real world. And he is interested in did research on digital central banking currencies. And this is very important for our blockchain center because some of you might think we should replace the Swiss franc, <laughs> and I'm pretty sure <laughs> Dirk will tell us we shouldn't. So it's all for you. So oh, thank you, Torsten, and uh, thanks very much for having me. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Um, um, people interested in fintech and, and blockchain, etc., technology, I understand. Um, so I want to disappoint you right at the beginning. I'm a macroeconomist, so I don't really have anything important to say about the blockchain. I'm really interested in money and the roles of money and, of course, what is going on uh, in fintech and people interested in the blockchain have similar interests, but my perspective will be rather a macroeconomic one rather than a, a technology perspective. So I hope this is nevertheless going to be uh, of some interest. Um, I realize this is not the first Zoom session that all of you or most of you are going to have today, so um, bear with me nevertheless. So I hope this is going to be uh, interesting. And now I try to upload my slides. Let's see whether this works. Do you see the slides? Yes. <clears throat> okay, perfect. Do you allow questions or at the end? Yeah, or? yeah. And um, please, um, actually, I would prefer if you interrupt me. Now, I'm not sure whether I'm sensitive enough to realize when you wave or, or do whatever, but maybe um, if the I can, organizers I can, help me, yeah, exactly. You just you scream concentrate or do on your presentation, and I'll check the chat and the Perfect. waves, and I will stop you. 
Now that would be great. So thanks very much. Okay, so what I'm trying to do, and we have about an hour, right? A bit less than an hour, I think. Right. Okay. What I'm, what I'm trying to do is I want to make five points today um, related to the question of, of uh, again, where I'm coming from, which is monetary <coughs> economics, and in particular CBDC, central bank digital currency. Uh, the first point um, I want to argue that um, at least from a macro point of view, this is not really such a novel discussion that we're having these days. The issues are not super new, but of course they are now very hotly debated because of um, things that are going on right now, but it's an older question. I want to spend just a few minutes on that. And then I really want to turn to CBDC, my perspective on central bank digital currency. I want to talk a bit about the fears that people have. If you talk to people in Zurich in the banks, uh, if you talk to somebody in a central bank, many will be very skeptical. Um, I want to address some of these fears that are circulating. Then I want to talk about the positive side, the promises that, are, um, uh, that come with CBDC. So what are potential benefits of implementing a CBDC? And then I want to raise a few minutes discussion about the risks that I see. And then finally talk about some of the actors in that game as I perceive it, well, who are the ones that propose and propone and push the ideas and who are the ones that are more skeptical and, and trying to avoid um, too much action on that front right now. So these are the, going to be the five points. And as Torsten suggested, please interrupt me at any time. Good. So. First about this, so what is digital money and what is CBDC? Uh, digital money sounds like, you know, we are starting to have digital money these days, but of course we don't uh, have digital money only starting now for the couple of last years. We have had that for many, many years. Uh, we have been using money on bank accounts for payments. We have been using credit cards. We have been using PayPal. We have been using, you name it, uh, for many, many years. Even in developing countries, people are using uh, phone credits, and uh, you know about all of that to, to make payments. So digital is not really the new thing about money. Maybe it is the kind of um, channels through which digital information is transmitted, the kind of privacy characteristics of these payments, etc., which are now being debated and improved on. But the digital feature is clearly not what is the new thing about uh, current discussions. And that's also true for central bank money. So CBDC, um, central bank digital currency, is not new because we haven't had digital central bank money so far. No, we have had that for many, many years. Um, actually, most of the central bank money that societies are using is digital money. And let me just show you a picture on that to make this a bit more concrete. So what this picture here is, is showing you is essentially the, the balance sheet of the Swiss National Bank in that case um, over the last, whatever, 50 years. So this starts in 1970 and it extends until more or less today. Uh, it's a log scale, just to warn you. And let me start from the, bottom, from the top, actually this gray line here, that's, think of this as the total liabilities of the Swiss National Bank. So all the money that the Swiss National Bank um, has issued. And uh, the two interesting components of this are the blue line and the sort of red or orange line. The sum of the blue and the orange is the gray one. And if you think this doesn't make sense, then again, recall this is a logarithmic scale. So that's why it looks um, maybe a bit strange. But what you see here is that in the early times, actually until the financial crisis uh, 2009, most of the money that the Swiss National Bank had issued, so most of the gray stuff was the blue stuff. And the blue stuff is banknotes. So basically the cash that we are carrying around in our purse, the Swiss, the 20 or 50 or 100 Swiss franc bill, that was most of the liabilities of the Swiss National Bank, most of the money at least that the Swiss National Bank issued at the time. And then there was this orange component with which, the rest, which was the rest, it wasn't that much. This red stuff is what the bank, the commercial banks have deposits at the Swiss National Bank. So you can think of the banks, the commercial banks, UBS, Credit Suisse, et cetera. Uh, they have some account at the Swiss National Bank and there they have deposits like we have a deposit at UBS say. So they have a deposit account at the Swiss National Bank and their 
assets, their reserves at the Swiss National Bank, these were this, this reddish orange line. And then as the financial crisis erupted, and since then, uh, the total amount of money issued by the Swiss National Bank has exploded from whatever it was here to whatever it is here. Again, this is a log scale. And you see now that most of that is actually now the orange thing. So most of the money that the Swiss National Bank issues or has issued are deposits essentially that are being held by the commercial banks at the Swiss National Bank. The cash in circulation is more or less a long trend. Actually, the trend has also increased a bit, the trend growth rate. So the, the increase in the growth rate of cash holdings has, well, this, this trend has, has um, steepened. But really, most of the action is here in the deposits that the commercial banks hold at the Swiss National Bank. So why am I going into all this? Because the point I wanted to make was very simple. Uh, even the, the money issued by the central bank, in this case, the Swiss National Bank, is mostly digital because this orange stuff is all digital money uh, that the commercial banks hold at the Swiss National Bank. And the, the physical stuff, the cash, is by now the smaller share, actually, of the central bank liabilities. Okay, conclusion from this, not only most money is digital, but even most central bank money is digital. So then you might ask, okay, so then why all this excitement about central bank digital currency if we already have this digital central bank money and actually we have it for, for ages, right? For, for many, many decades. And I think what is the really interesting aspect from a macro point of view now in the discussion about CBDC is on the one hand, of course, all the, you know, the technical issues that come with that. How should we implement it? What are the privacy features? You know, who's in charge? So maybe these kind of questions that, that many of you are probably interested in. But then from a macro point of view, what is interesting here is the question, you know, who has access to this central bank digital currency? So far, was it was... Question, there was a question in the chat. Yeah, please. So <clears throat> concerning your previous slide, so does the slide imply that the QE was not effective because all the money didn't go to the people, it stayed in the banks? Well, I mean, if, if this is your measure of, of effectiveness, then the answer, I guess, would be yes. I'm not sure whether this was the intention. I mean, you have to, you have to remember that uh, after the financial crisis, regulation has changed. Uh, uh, many institutions, the BIS, the Bank, of Interna Bank for International Settlements and the national central banks have been very eager to make sure that commercial banks hold more liquid assets. And that of course includes this orange stuff, right? Their account at the central bank. So there was certainly some, uh, there, there, there was a strong motivation on the part of regulators to induce banks to, to be to have a larger share of their assets being in liquid assets, all this kind of liquidity regulation that came after the financial crisis. So I think the intention was not that all of these additional central bank, um, you know, money being held by the commercial banks would eventually give rise to additional money creation that ends up in the hands of the real economy, so to speak but maybe a bit more of that, yes. And in particular, you also have to keep in mind that um, the central bank, the Swiss National Bank has been fighting now for many years what it perceives to be an overvalued exchange rate. And some of that is reflected, of course, in this um, huge amounts of money that the commercial banks hold at the Swiss so this National Bank. figure would be different in the US and in Europe? The magnitudes would be different, for okay. sure. But the, comp the change in the composition would not be that different, no. Okay. Yes, thank you. Sure, sure. So what is, what is so different apart from <coughs> uh, the, the technology side of CBDC? I think what the, from my perspective, the exciting part of CBDC or about CBDC is that we are talking now about the possibility that not only the commercial banks, but also you and me, so the private guy on the street, would in principle have the possibility to hold central bank issued money, not only uh, deposits that say UBS or, or Credit Suisse or the Zurcher Kantonalbank have issued, but also digital money that the Swiss National Bank or some other central bank has issued. And I will come in a few slides to why I think this is uh, an interesting option and what the potential consequences of that are. 
So in my view, therefore, a much better, a much more fitting name, at least from my macro perspective, is not CBDC, but what I used to call reserves for all. So reserves are the accounts that uh, commercial banks hold at the Swiss National Bank. So these, these, these deposits, so to speak, are called reserves, at least in some lingo. And now we would have the option, or what we are talking about, is to basically make this possibility of holding reserves at the central bank, um, we're talking about making this an option for everybody, for, for, for all uh, people in society. So that's what we are, I think, talking about. Okay, so, so what are the fears? I'm already slowing down here, sorry. So if you talk to somebody at the, at the central bank, at least somebody who holds responsibility, um, and um, you, pro, you, you, you suggest this um, possibility that we all have access to central bank digital currency, then a typical answer was, or maybe still is, but it certainly was until recently, that this is a disastrous idea. You should, you should um, certainly not think about that. Why? Because um, the immediate association is that, well, you know, if people move um, their funds from, let me just say UBS without implying that I'm talking about UBS here. This is my example of a commercial bank. If they're using their funds from UBS to the Swiss National Bank, then there is a big black um, hole, right? Opening up on the liability side of UBS because part of their funding is um, deposits, retail deposits. And if we were to give people the possibility to hold funds at the Swiss National Bank in whatever form, then there would potentially be some shift of the funds, of the funding from the commercial banking sector to the um, central bank sector. And this, um, at least this is the, the typical line of argument, this would be very dangerous because number one, banks would lose funding and bank funding is important to the extent that it you know, funds some projects that are on the asset side of banks balance sheet. Maybe there would be less credit extension to the real economy. Uh, fewer mortgages being extended and etc. You name it. So there's a there's a potential issue here in the term in the sense that maybe banks would less be able to provide what they're supposed to do, namely to provide funds to the real economy. On top of this, if this switch from the commercial banks to the national bank would go very abruptly, or maybe during bad uh, times, during times of crisis, would go very abruptly, there is a sense that this would undermine financial stability. It could foster what is called a bank run. So everybody running and trying to withdraw funds from the bank to, to bring them to safety. There could be more of those issues. That's what the argument says. If you provide people with this new option uh, where they could um, hold um, means of payment, namely in the form of CBDC. <clears throat> now, this is, this is a, an argument which, on the one hand, sounds very convincing, in particular if you, come, uh, uh, if you talk to somebody with a banking background who thinks about the bank as an institution that is trying to manage some scarce liquidity, some scarce um, funds that are being provided by the central bank, and they're trying to you know, manage that in the best possible way. But if you take a macro perspective, then this is much less convincing because money uh, is essentially free for the central bank to create, right? If the, central, if the Swiss National Bank wants to create more money, then they either print it, and that's not very costly, or they just, you know, credit an account of a commercial bank and a digital uh, an account at the bank, and that's just essentially totally costless to do. So creating central bank money has very, very low social cost in the sense of it doesn't require many resources to do this. So you wonder how can it make such a big difference, right? Whether this institution pushes a button or whether it doesn't push a button, can this really create havoc in the real economy? It's not obvious if you think about this from a macroeconomic point of view. And if you think more carefully about the, the balance sheet, then maybe it is not um, that convincing at all. So I see there's a Q&A here. Let me, let me click on that button. Hi, Corinne. Wouldn't the shift of funds help commercial banks to reduce their negative yielding reserves at the central bank? Yeah, in current times, actually it could. I agree, yeah. So in the current environment where, where some banks would actually be happy to get rid of some of their liquid assets, such a shift could actually be beneficial for them. But I think that the major fear that central bankers have when they think about CBDC are the normal times, 
in which um, retail uh, deposit funding for banks is important and they, they, they would be afraid of losing that. But I think you're perfectly right. In the current situation, everything is different anyway, yeah. Okay, so let, let me get to, to, let me get to back, let me get back to this, um, oh, there was another Q&A, sorry. No, no, you should concentrate on your presentation. Okay, so I let you manage the question. I answered the question exactly the same way you did. <laughs> okay, perfect. Okay, so, so what should we make of this argument? Let me show you a balance sheet here, or three balance sheets, actually. Um, so all you really should look at is the green stuff and the sort of orange stuff here, both here and here and here. All the other colors are just to show off. So what this is supposed to show you is the balance sheet of the household sector, the balance sheet of the commercial banks, and the balance sheet of the government and the central bank. So this is the SMB, this is the commercial banks, and that's us. And what we, are, what we want to think about is a situation in which we introduce CBDC, and that means that people presumably are going to hold more central bank issued money, which is the green stuff, and less of the bank, commercial bank issued deposits, which is the, the orange brown stuff here. So these two arrows are supposed to indicate that the household used to have this much um, central bank money. And now with the introduction of CBDC, um, these guys hold more central bank money and correspondingly fewer deposits. So that's what this shift, the, the green segment gets larger, the orange segment gets smaller. That's what we sort of think about. That's the scenario that we, that we want to uh, consider. Now, the immediate response that you get from a central banker would be that um, she would look at the central banks, sorry, at the commercial banks balance sheet over here and she, and she would argue correctly, well, but you know, if these guys hold fewer deposits, then the banks have fewer deposits as a liability. So their funding, which used to be this area here, shrinks now to this lower quadrangle over here. So this, this amount of funding is lost for commercial banks and that could create problems, they argue, because you know whatever has been funded on the asset side out of that stuff uh, can no longer be funded. So that's a potential problem. And the bank run story would be, you know, if this goes very, very abruptly, then banks immediately lose this and maybe they have to sell some assets, there's fire sales, there's all kinds of problems. We don't want that. And that's so far correct, the argument, but what you also have to consider is the fact that if the households hold more central bank issued money, so if this green stuff gets larger, then the corresponding um, the, the, the mirror image of that is that on the central bank's balance sheet, the liabilities of the central bank get larger. That's the same thing, right? The green stuff here has to equal the green stuff here. But if the central bank has additional funding, additional liabilities outstanding, then the next question is, and I think that question is not typically asked, but it should be asked, you know, where is this funding going to? What does the central bank do with this additional amount of funding that they receive when we hold central bank digital currency? And um, you can think about many scenarios, right? Maybe the, the central bank uses these additional funds to buy gold or to buy houses or to buy US treasuries. But one scenario is also that the central bank just channels this new stuff, this new funding back to the banks. So the central bank could lend to the banks. And there's many questions, right? What kind of collateral do they would require from the banks? Uh, at what price, at what interest rate would they do this, et cetera, et cetera. But the only point I want to make here is that there is at least one scenario in which the banks would end up with exactly the same amount of funding as before and that scenario is the one in which the central bank is basically acting like an intermediary. It issues new money to the, cent to the households. They hold that stuff. So they provide funding to the central bank. And the central bank is basically just rechanneling that stuff back into the banking sector. If the central bank does that to conditions that are comparable to what the deposits um, yielded before this whole intervention, then for the banks, nothing has changed really. And you can make this much more precise. So this is supposed to show you that there is a way through which the central bank could rechannel funds to the banking sector. And the, the, uh, Markus Brunemeyer in, in Princeton, we, we have a paper last year, this came out, where we make this much more precise and where we argue that uh, in a model that is 
in our perspective, rather general, at least if you are an economist, then you would consider this to be a rather uh, a general uh, formulation of how we think about these issues. There's always a way for the central bank to basically insulate the banking sector from this change in regime, from this introduction of central bank digital currency. But more importantly, there's a way for the central bank to make sure that not only for the banks, but really for the for the real economy as a whole, nothing changes essentially. So if the central bank does this rechanneling and a few other things on the site, it can basically ensure that the environment for the different agents in the economy, most importantly for the banking sector, are essentially unchanged. And therefore also the bank behavior would be essentially unchanged. And there's no reason to expect therefore that um, credit extension would suffer uh, that mortgages would there would be fewer mortgages extended etc cetera, etc cetera. now this is a theoretical result but uh, let me stress again that we believe that this holds under rather general conditions and uh, uh, we cannot or certainly i cannot think of first order practical implement, uh, uh, implications that would um, undermine this result at least sort of locally saying for small changes if you do really big changes things can happen but as a first approximation I think this channeling through this refinancing of the banking sector by the central bank works from a macroeconomic point of view. Of course, there's issues, and I'll get to that in a few slides. But the, really the big point here that I wanted to make with this, with this uh, slide is that this, this first fear that you hear very, very often when you think about and talk about CBDC to economists, this very prominent fear, um, you know, you have to take with some grain of salt. Uh, it's not obvious that these negative consequences would result. And I think under very general conditions, actually, you can always think about ways under which it would not result. So that's the first point that I want to make. But you might have less bank runs, right? Because people trust the central bank and the central bank trusts the commercial bank. Exactly. So that's, that's something I will get to. Um, so for now, all I wanted to say, actually, these fears are overrated. We shouldn't think that there are these, these negative outcomes are necessary. But now what you said, Torsten, is that we can actually think about positive things, right? Not only does this negative scenario not necessarily have to come and the central bank could avoid it. No, on top of this, the central bank could actually do other things such that not only it replicates the status quo, but it improves on the status quo. And one point you just mentioned, um, I'll get to that in a second. Let me start with the more simple stuff. Um, first of all, obviously, right? I mean, to get the status quo, uh, what I told you before on the, when I showed you the, the, the balance sheets, um, the central bank would, would um, provide this, this new funding to the commercial banks at certain conditions. It would basically make sure that the, the environment, the competitive environment for the banks would be the same as before, such that they don't change their behavior. But of course, the, the central bank could behave differently. It could you know, try to foster competition in the banking sector. There's lots of research that argues that there is very limited, or maybe strong lack of competition in particular in the deposit um, uh, sector. And not in Switzerland, but in other countries, there's huge issues about financial inclusion. It's so important, so so um, so costly for um, low-income people to uh, to get a bank account, to get access to the formal financial sector. Things like this um, there could be changed um, if there is a very basic CBDC option available to the general public. The monetary policy transmission mechanism could change depending on what the central bank does. Today, this mechanism basically relies on the, the change in the interest rate or the QE or whatever the central bank is doing, which is basically interaction with the banking sector. Um, the central bank relies on that impulse being propagated by banks to the real economy because the, the central bank doesn't really have a direct connection to the real economy. With CBDC, that would change. Uh, the central bank would have more levers to directly interact with the real sector. The too big to fail problems could to some extent be alleviated. If you think about what is it that forces the central bank and the government in crisis times to intervene and to rescue banks, it is the fear that if they don't rescue the bank, then everything, you know, everything collapses. There's huge, huge problems. And one of the big problems that we fear, 
is that the payment mechanism, that the payment system would collapse or would at least suffer to some extent, right? If a big commercial bank breaks down, then all the, the, the firms and the households uh, who have accounts with that bank and who want to make payments or want to pay their rent or whatever, they would have problems doing that, at least in the short run. And that's a very, very important reason for, uh, for rescuing those banks because a breakdown of the payment system, even if it's just for a couple of days, is extremely costly for, the, for society. So that's a big, issue, big incentive to, to help banks if they're in trouble. But if you had CBDC and if sufficiently many people held CBDC and had an account that they could use for payments, then of course, then this, this motive to help banks would be much um, reduced because you know, people had alternatives that they could use to make their payments. And finally, the point that um, the Torsten raised a few minutes before, there's reasons actually not to believe, uh, to believe that financial stability wouldn't suffer as many people argue, but actually the opposite because in the world that I showed you, in this world here, the central bank would now be a major creditor of the bank. And a bank run is a situation where everybody thinks for herself, well, you know, this bank seems to be in trouble. Let me get my money and run and invest it somewhere else. And people don't internalize that with this action, they actually negatively affect everybody else who also has an account at the bank. Because if I run, then the problems for everybody left become even bigger. So that's why everybody has an incentive to run rather early and quickly. But if you have a central bank invested here as well, then this is a guy that internalizes these externalities or at least can internalize these externalities if they behave optimally. So this bank run externalities, these negative externalities are actually um, alleviated and the financial stability problem arising from them is actually reduced. So all of these are things that could actually improve if the central bank is not only trying to replicate the status quo as they can, as I showed you before, but if they are doing things a bit differently and actually better than in the current situation. There's two more things that I think are important these days. One concerns monetary sovereignty. That's not really an issue in Switzerland yet because uh, we don't worry about dollarization. We don't worry that people start to use the US dollar or even the Euro as a means of payment. Um, but in many other countries, that's the case, right? I mean, dollarization has happened in many developing countries in particular, and the countries are not too happy about that because, you know, um, they lose some impact on, on what they can do in the domestic economy. So they try actually to convince people to use domestic currency, and CBDC would be an argument in favor of that because it provides more facilities than just the usual cash that people otherwise can use. There's also a national security argument for those of you who follow these discussions about um, all these kind of sanctions that most of the US imposes on whoever is just uh, in disfavor in the US, and typically this is Iran or Cuba or North Korea, on sometimes I guess Europe, sometimes not. And so there's, 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 uh, the US has in, uh, amazingly powerful means to put pressure on countries because um, essentially for many, international payments, uh, even if they go through SWIFT, which is an organization based in Belgium, uh, very often you, you have to interact with US financial intermediaries. And of course the US can, don can, can dictate US banks how they should behave. So for, for most international payments and actually for therefore for most international business relations, the US has an extremely strong, has extremely strong power to impose their um, international policy considerations or preferences on what other countries can do. And uh, whatever, you know, is a means to get a bit, to get a bit more flexibility in that respect. And I think CBDC would provide a bit more flexibility in that respect and um, would, would give the other countries more international sovereignty than what they currently have. I think this is one of the reasons why countries like China are pushing their domestic CBDC um, programs and trying to convince other countries to conduct more payments in the Chinese currency than in US dollars, because this would help them to get a bit out of this um, US dominated international financial system. A last point that I think is, is a bit maybe esoteric, but I think it is important, at least for depending on your views about the government. Um, the argument is the following. These days, uh, the government in Switzerland, or in, uh, let's, take, let's take the Eurozone, there the, the example is more striking. Take France or Italy. 
Um, in the Eurozone, you have this, the European Central Bank, which issues euros. The euros are the legal tender, so this is the government issued money. And um, they also issue cash. The question is, where can you use this government issued money? If you want to issue cash, then you're basically uh, at a cap, I think in Italy or in France, around maybe 2,000 euros. You're not legally allowed to use more than uh, than 2,000 euros cash for payments, because otherwise you're getting suspect. Uh, there might be some tax evasion or even criminal activity behind that. Governments want to avoid that for, for understandable reasons, I guess. But it's a bit absurd, in my view at least, that the government issued money, which for us, for the regular citizens, is just cash, can basically be used only for a very limited set of, of, of payments. So if you want to pay your rent, if you want to pay, if you want to buy a car, if you want to buy something more valuable, basically you have to use digital payment options for that, your credit card or you make a bank transfer. But if you do this, the government essentially forces you to use the money that has been issued by a commercial bank. The government forbids you to use the government issued money for most of the payments that we actually make. And that's a bit of a strange situation. If you had CBDC, that would be a digital means of payment. And then you could pay your rent or your car or whatever you want to pay for with the government issued money. And I think that's, to me at least, sounds like a more natural situation than a situation where a government issues money but then forbids people to use it. So these are some of the advantages that I see with um, CBDC. What are the risks? I don't see these huge risks on the macro side, uh, as I tried to convince you before. So I don't think these are the main considerations. I think the, the really big risks are more what, what, in, what in economics we call political economy risks. So the interaction between government action and, and economics. Um, number one, if you did this CBDC experiment that I described, so let me show you the balance sheet again, you have CBDC, you have a longer balance sheet of the central bank because now the central bank issues more money. And the larger bank balance sheet is, um, you know, it can be neutral if the government does or the central bank does what I described to you before, but there's much more, you know, there's much more, how should I say this? It's, it, it's get, it gets much more interesting for policymakers. And you see this already now in Switzerland, right? Switzerland is really a country where we have a very strong belief in the independence of the Swiss National Bank. We have a very broad majority in society is convinced that it's a good idea to have the, the Swiss National Bank being largely independent of the daily political business. But even in Switzerland now, we have a lot of discussion about, you know, what should the Swiss National Bank do with its balance sheet? How should it invest um, the funding that it has gotten from, um, you know, by issuing money? How should it invest the assets? Um, what should be done with the central bank profits? You know, should they go to finance AHV? Should they go to finance the corona debt or whatever? So there's, no, there's a lot of political discussion about that. And central banks are typically not too happy about that because they believe correctly, I think, that um, they should be in charge of their balance sheet and they should choose the structure of their balance sheet in order to pursue the objectives that they were given, which is essentially monetary stability. But you know, if you have large profits, if you have a large balance sheet, then there's a lot of things that you can do. And um, there's lots of people who like you to do specific things. So there's a, there's a in my view, a rather large political risk associated with a larger um, um, central bank balance sheet. There's another issue which relates to transparency. <clears throat> Let me go once more back to this um, balance sheet representation here. If, let me take the extreme example in which all of us, all of the households would switch to CBDC. So all this reddish stuff would be replaced by the green stuff, which means that the central bank would have a rather large balance sheet and it would re-channel a lot of this new funding back into the banking sector. So the central bank would basically totally replace these household deposits over here. This would be a world that is in all matters macroeconomic. So whatever the macroeconomic implications are concerned, it would be exactly identical to the current situation. Um, if the central bank were to re-channel in this equivalent way, nothing would change. But there would still be a major discrepancy relative to the current situation in the sense that 
the world would look very differently because people would suddenly realize that the central bank basically funds the banks. It's not no longer the households that fund the banks, but it's the central banks that fund the bank. And if the central bank were still to do this under the same conditions as the households were doing it before, so at rather low interest rates in normal times at least, then there might be questions being asked, right? The one question being asked might be, okay, if it's really the Swiss National Bank that creates money and nobody else, and then the Swiss National Bank is refunding the banks through a loan facility essentially, why should the Swiss National Bank do this at these very low interest rates? If, you know, if, the, if the risk-free interest rate say is 2% or 1%, why should the central bank refund the banks at 0.01 or something um, interest if this is what the households used to do before? So that's what I mean when I talk about um, transparency. The whole, the, the, the mechanism, the mechanics of the current monetary system that we live in would be uh, much more transparent than they currently are. And this might give rise to questions that some people might like and some other people might not like. I think the Folgeld people, they would like those questions being asked. I could imagine that some banks would not like these questions being asked. There is a last case uh, where I see some risk from CBDC, also in the political domain mostly, which relates to the use of cash. If we had CBDC available, then um, I think it's safe to assume that um, some people would use less cash than they are using now, and they would use more CBDC than they're using now. So the, the user base for cash would probably fall. There would be fewer people that use cash. And that in turn might give rise to new discussions, maybe not in Switzerland and Germany, but in other countries of abolishing cash altogether. And abolishing cash altogether would be politically more attractive in that case because fewer people would use it. So fewer people would oppose to that idea. I think it would be a bad idea in the end. I think cash is, is useful. It is another option in particular in crisis times. It's, it's an insurance policy against super bad monetary policy. I think we should keep it. And I fear that if we had CBDC, there would be less support for maintaining cash. So I see that as a risk. Okay, who is in favor of, um, of, of CBDC and who is against it? Uh, let me start with who is against it. Um, and here I, I, I just I, I mentioned banks knowing that this is not actually true. I think it's, it very much depends on whom you talk to at the banks. There's this famous, um, infamous, I guess, argument uh, between a, a Swiss professor and the CEO of a Swiss bank on YouTube somewhere where the CEO argues, um, well, are you crazy? Are you telling me that banks create money? Something like this. And of course they do. Uh, and, and banks in principle would have an interest of arguing that this is not happening and that they don't profit from that. But I think it's safe to assume that at least in normal times, it's important that banks create money and it's important for their business model. So the typical CEO, I guess, would not like the idea of replacing uh, bank funding by households um, through some new arrangement in which we have CBDC and the bank would more rely, have, have to rely more on what the central bank is doing. Of course, if you talk to other people at banks, uh, lower level people, my impression is that they are actually much more favorable to that idea. Already during the Folgeld times two, two or three years ago, and many people at banks that I talk to, um, they of course understand how banks work, how banks balance sheets work. And many of them seem to think that this is a bit of a fishy arrangement and that it would probably be not sustainable if people would understand it. So there's some sympathy, I guess, in banks uh, to that, but my understanding is not at the really high levels. This is a picture from a paper that I'm just working on, which tries to illustrate the dimensions of what we are talking about here. So what I did here, let me just tell you what, what I'm doing in that paper. I'm trying to understand, <clears throat> sorry, if we were to move to that world in which all deposits were replaced by central bank digital currency, so that banks would basically have to rely on central bank funding if we wanted to keep everything from a macro perspective the same. So if we were in this re-channeling world that I showed you before in, in terms of these balance sheets. What would this imply for the cost of funding for banks? So what I compare here is what is the interest rate 
at which the central bank would refund the funds to the banks if it wanted to keep everything the same. So that's sort of the equivalent interest rate that would replicate the current arrangement. And if you compare this to maybe a more reasonable interest rate, which would be a typical loan interest rate that the central bank would charge the commercial banks for, for some fully collateralized risk-free lending. So the risk-free interest rate. And if you compare now, what would be the cost for the banking sector if you had the risk-free interest rate, so the loan interest rate, relative to what is the cost of funding for the commercial banks if they get this better deal, which tries to basically keep the system or the situation as it was before, then you get a difference between two interest rates and you can, uh, you can assess how much this is in total if you look at the total funding that banks get from these sources. And you can calculate what, what amount of funding cost reduction or increase in funding cost this would amount to relative to GDP in total. And this is a, these are the numbers for the US that, that, I came up from, uh, that I came up with. This would be 1% of GDP. This would be minus 1% of GDP down here. And this is from uh, 1999 to 2018, something like this. So what you see here, I don't really have time to, to go into detail why this is fluctuating and why it's positive sometimes and negative sometimes. But what you see is that in terms of magnitude, this is somewhere between plus 1% of GDP and minus 1% of GDP. So these are the magnitudes that we are talking about. And when you think about, you know, what would be the change in the cost of funding that you could get if banks would have to finance in different ways, if they could not finance themselves in the current way in which they essentially have to pay for their funding in a way as if they were creating liquidity, which in the end is actually created by the Swiss National Bank. So all I want to say here is these are huge amounts that we are talking about. And if people were to look at this arrangement differently and were to think about is this actually the right way to have the banks or the central bank create money or should they should we have different prices for what is going on here, then this could really make a difference for, for the, the profits of commercial banks. In some times it would reduce them, but in recent years, actually it would have increased the, the profits of banks. That's a bit surprising, but I, I don't have time to go into that. Okay, so the banks are potentially on the side of the resistance of the opponents. The central banks also are typically, but again, there uh, depends on whom you talk to. If you talk to the people in charge, then they are mostly very skeptical. Although the attitudes have softened quite a bit last year around June when Libra was, uh, was a big thing, then if you read the, what the BIS was writing before Libra and what the BIS was writing after Libra, you see a certain change in tone and um, for good reasons, I think. But typically central banks are rather skeptical. Now, if you talk to people um, again, not the, the people in charge, but a little bit lower, then I think there's also much more openness. And uh, because again, people are aware how the system works. There is, there is questions that can be asked about whether this is the best of all possible systems that we can think of. And it's not obvious that this is the best system that we live in. Um, so I think it's worthwhile asking these questions. But then, again, if I were Thomas Jordan, I would probably be very hesitant and very much opposed to the idea of CBDC because currently the system seems to work somehow at least. And you know who knows what would be when we have a completely different monetary arrangement. So there's certainly a reason to be on the conservative side if you want to consider such drastic changes in the monetary system. Now, who is on the pro side? <clears throat> there's many people, I think, in the audience that probably are on the pro side. Uh, there's certainly people like the Folgeld crowd who would probably be on the pro side. But I think that implicitly, implicitly, a lot of the private sector is actually pushing for CBDC. And as I wrote in some, some, some note a few um, months ago, I think that all these developments that we see now uh, on Trust Square and in digital finance, FinTech, all over the place, and of course, uh, due to Libra and all these other initiatives that we are seeing, stable coins, et cetera, there's a lot of action in the private sector. And eventually, that's my belief, governments will, whether they like it or whether they will not like it, they will eventually move because for them, it's still the better option to have CBDC than letting the private sector do it and letting um, many people 
essentially use these new digital payments that the private sector provides. Everybody in principle can create money. If you find somebody who accepts your piece of paper, your promise, then you have created money. So that's not too difficult per se, if you can find somebody who trusts you. Um, you cannot outlaw this. This is why the whole Folgeld initiative was, um, I think, maybe had good questions, but certainly not a good answer. You cannot, you cannot outlaw money creation just by writing a law. Banks and other agencies will always find ways around that. So the but only thing that you can do, sorry? I cannot pay my taxes with the money which Claudio is issuing. That's, an, yeah. <laughs> well, that's not, that's not clear actually. Let, let me get back to that in, in, in two minutes. That's actually a very interesting question about the taxes. In principle, I think it's very, very hard to legally abolish a form of payment, to, to forbid people to use a certain amount of money. In particular, when many people start using it, then we are back to these too big to fail problems. At some point, the government feels obliged to ex post support these systems because it can no longer afford to not doing it. And it's very hard to write a law that says you're not allowed to do this because you know money is not something that you can define very precisely. Money is whatever two of us think is money. When we start using it as money, then it is money, whether you have written a law about this or not. So I think there will always be people and banks and people in the financial sector and Goldman Sachs for sure and some smart lawyers to create money. And it will be very hard to outlaw that. And therefore the best strategy for governments will be that they offer something else, which is um, at least as good or maybe even better because governments have a very strong incentive to um, induce us, the people to use the government issued money because once we use the government issued money, the government has a lever to do many things, um, mostly to our benefit, but maybe also not. And certainly governments therefore have an incentive to provide something which is useful for us as a means of payment. And that's why that's in my view is the strongest force that will push towards CBDC in the next whatever, 10 years. Uh, at least I would be surprised if in 10 years we don't have it in, 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 in a series of countries. Let me get back to that point of Torsten. That's another sort of very abstruse, uh, strange situation, right? That we, you, you cannot even use the government issued money to pay your taxes, right? It's really strange. Many the theories paper, in economics. You mean the paper money? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, I mean, that's the only one that we have access to, right? Right, yes. yes. So there's, there's actually an interesting law case in Germany. There's a journalist who has insisted now for many years that he wants to pay his broadcasting fees, so the radio and TV fees, he wants to pay them in cash because he says, you guys are a government agency. I want to pay with a government legal tender, which in my case is only cash. That's all I have. So if you don't accept the government issued money, there must be something wrong with the system. And he has gone through all different layers of, um, of the courts. And I think the highest German court, not the constitutional court in this case, but some, um, I'm not sure which court is in charge of that. They actually told him that um, he, I mean, they, they, they sort of supported him, but I think now it's at the European court of justice or somewhere, um, still, um, still an open question, but, um, in any case, so it's a very interesting question, you know, if you cannot use the government issued money even to pay your dues to the government, then this seems somehow wrong, right? At least in my view. Okay. Um, these were my points. Uh, let me just repeat. Uh, there's nothing new about digital here, neither when it comes to money in general, nor when it comes to central bank money that has been digital for many years. What from a macro point of view is different about CBDC is that the general public would have access to digital central bank issued money. There are some fears floating around. I think they're overrated. I think central banks could always uh, make sure that we basically stay where we are. But on top of this, they could actually do better. There's a couple of dimensions where at least if you have a good central bank in charge, they could improve on the current situation. But if you have a bad central bank in charge or a, or a central bank that is too much under the influence of policy, of, of politics, I mean, there's risks. And um, so there's trade-offs here as usual. I told you a bit of uh, why I think that we might get there, mostly because you guys, I suppose in the private sector um, are pushing for alternatives to that. And this is, I think, helping CBDC in the longer term. <laughs>
Okay, so that's it from my side. Uh, yes, thank you. We have many, many questions. <laughs> let me let me just uh, stop by pointing you on my website. There's a bit of writing. If you want to see what I wrote on that, you can search there for mostly reserves for all. Then you find a couple of notes and, and other stuff on that. Thank you very much. But now, yeah, please uh, go ahead with questions. <clears throat> so I don't know whether the participants can speak, Claudio. Shall I pose the questions? I don't know. I think uh, I'm not sure. Probably you have to. The participants do not have the right to, unfortunately, to speak. Sorry for the freedom. Okay, so let, so let me let me Please. start with, with some questions. So one question was: How would the central bank allocate the money to the commercial banks? Will this be some rationing, or is there a price mechanism, it's like interest rates? Yeah. So the so the in the in that result in which we argue you get equivalence the following would happen suppose I have money at UBS and I want to uh, withdraw that from UBS and I would um, instead would like to hold my money in CBDCs let's say there's an account that I have at the Swiss National Bank okay. and the Swiss National Bank sees this um, this this transfer this incoming payment from UBS to from my UBS account to the Swiss National Bank account. Uh, my account at the Swiss National Bank would be credited and the Swiss National Bank would immediately refund um, uh, the UBS exactly in the amount uh, that corresponds to the payment that came from UBS. And it would do so at exactly the same conditions if you want to generate this equivalent outcome um, subject to which I held my funds at UBS. Yes, but once this transition has been done, <clears throat> as you said, the money which the people hold with the central bank will ultimately also go to the commercial banks. So at which rate? What is the collateral? What is the interest they have to pay? The interest rate would be the one that uh, UBS paid me before okay. for the equivalence to hold. Now, whether this is what, what the Swiss National Bank would like to do is a different question. Collateral is another issue. So collateral is an issue that could, uh, could be a problem here. It could be a problem if you argue that uh, the current household deposits at UBS are not collateralized, but the SNB might ask for collateral. That could be a reason for non-equivalence. But then you have to ask yourself, you know, why would the SNB um, ask for collateral when it directly funds UBS, but it does not ask for collateral when it provides the lend of last resort guarantees that it currently does in the current system? So the, UB, the SMB would in some sense behave differently in the current system and in this equivalent regime. But collateral is an issue that is, depending on how the central bank behaves, the outcome would be affected by this, absolutely, yes. Then there was a question that this result which you have with Marcus, maybe it assumes too much rationality on side of the people or to phrase it differently, how would you manage the expectations that such a transition would be possible? I think for the on the side of the households on the private sector, it doesn't really require much, right? I mean, the experiment that I considered on the on the slides with the balance sheets was basically that um, Torsten decided he doesn't want to hold money at UBS anymore. Instead, he wants to hold money at the Swiss National Bank for whatever reason, right? I don't care, and that. The, the only thing who has to act who has to act in a smart way here is the Swiss National Bank, because they have to think about okay this money came from UBS so Torsten withdrew from UBS and now um, credit and, and now deposited uh, at the SMB so we have to make sure that our funding the SMB funding will go back to UBS so Torsten doesn't have to think about this just the SMB has to think about it and they have to think about under what conditions do we do this. Do we want to ask for collateral? All these kind of things. But I don't think it asks anything in terms of rationality on the part of the, the, the bank customers. That's good news. <laughs> it is good news, right? Exactly, well, because you would otherwise you would tell us immediately it has no, it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> no point, right? Um, then, of course, since we are a blockchain group, the important question is, shouldn't we give up totally about digital central bank? Maybe we should try decentralized digital, as you mentioned with Libra and some other things. So what is the advantage to centralizing it? Uh, you mean as opposed to privately issued money? Yes, yeah, so maybe 
you know, there's a long, ever coming backstory whether you should have competition with currencies yeah. or not, yeah. and this and that. The yeah. banking school, the currency school, and this and that, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Maybe yeah. now with the new technology, it's time to have more competition. Yeah. I mean, so I don't really. Well, I think if you, if I were in charge, I would favor a government issued money over a, a private sector issued money. I don't believe too much in this um, currency, con this Hayekian idea that you should have many currencies right. competing, etc. I mean, some people would argue we have examples where this worked in history. We have other people who would argue this has actually not worked very well. For example, I think if you uh, would ask, um, yeah, the Swiss experience, I think, would be mixed. Now, I think there's a strong argument for having relatively few currencies, right? If a country, if in Switzerland we had like 10 currencies and, and you have a chance of one to 10 that you meet somebody who uses your preferred currency, this would just create complications. But we, so have, there, 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 we have an app for that to transfer it, like Revolut. <laughs> And you mean you, there's, a, there's an app to, that basically has a, an exchange well, rate that fluctuates? It's complicated without technology, but now there's nothing to be done, right? There's just an app right. that would compute it. But then, I would, but then if, if we have that already, if we are that far, I'm not sure whether we're really that far, that people would be willing to live with um, continuously changing exchange rates. I think people prefer to think about one anchor so they think about my rent is whatever, 2000 Swiss francs and an apple costs two francs. And, and, and I don't want that the, the shop at the, the border shop uh, changes, uh, charges me in, I don't know, in Libra and uh, my landlord charges me in, um, in US dollar or in Tether or whatever. So, and then the exchange rate is whatever it is at its current instant. I think there is an issue there, but if we are really that far, then the point is a much broader one. Then we actually don't need currencies anymore, right? Then we can directly use assets to make payments, right? Suppose I have IBM stock and I wanna buy uh, whatever. I think in the people that are listening now, you probably all have Lamborghinis or these kind of cars. So I want to buy a car. Then, um, you know, I just go to the car dealer and um, he tells me, you know, this is, this costs, whatever it costs, maybe one Lamborghini unit. And then I go on my app and there's a current market price for IBM stock vis-a-vis -vis Lamborghinis. And then I sell as many IBM stock as I have to. So in that world in which all the assets are completely liquid and I can use each asset to exchange it against some other asset or some other commodity, then I don't need money anymore. I don't need this, this intermediate medium, which has sort of a relatively stable price <clears> in which all other commodities and assets are priced relative to. I think this could be the future, right? I mean, then we just need a big database and we need very liquid markets. And then we don't need to hold real balances anymore in that world. I think we are still quite a bit apart from that one though. Right. So then it's the question, what is the advantage of national currencies? Because Libra was the idea to have some international currency, right? Right. So um, this is, there's a big question in, in macroeconomics about uh, the optimal, what they call it, the macroeconomists call the optimal currency um, area. Um, area. Sorry, thank you, Torsten. The optimal currency area. So the question really is, you know, does it make sense for Switzerland to have their own currency or should they adopt the euro? Does it make sense that uh, Germany and Italy have the same currency? Well, and the, the arguments that are being made in that debate are typically <clears throat> if um, different countries say or different regions in the country face rather similar shocks. So if you have a, uh, if you have a boom in Germany, then you also have a boom in Italy and vice versa so that the monetary policy demands are relatively similar across these regions, then it might make more sense to have a joint currency. If you have a situation where in some years you need an expansionary monetary policy in Germany, but you need the opposite in Italy, and two years later, again, they want to go in different directions, then it, has, it makes much less sense to have a common um, currency. Some factors that play a role there are how mobile are production factors, how mobile are workers, how much trade do you have these kind of considerations? And um, so these are arguments that, that, that shape this trade-off. On the one hand, you would like to have a few currencies 
as possible because again you have you have less um, worries about exchanging one against the other you don't have to think about all these exchange rates at the same time you want to maintain some flexibility to to get more possibilities for policymakers to accommodate certain regional specific shocks and for this you want to have more currencies across different regions now typically we have one currency per country with some exceptions like the euro for example um, yeah, it's, a, it's an open debate. There's a very interesting paper by Markus Brunnermeyer and um, Harold James, I think, and um, a third co-author, I don't remember right now, last year. They wrote about this from a new perspective now with, with fintech and with all these different currencies are being created. What some people are debating these days is maybe we should have a currency for all the dentists, right? And, all, and another currency for all the car dealers. I don't know, because maybe... All the, all the dentists face similar considerations, similar shocks, so they should have a current, a, a common currency to deal with each other. And then, you know, there are the, then there are the butchers or somebody else, another group, they have very different considerations. They want to have very different services from the money that they use than what the dentists need. So maybe that would be another dimension to separate currencies, not across countries, but across professions or across um, different exposures that people have. So there's, there's many dimensions that you can think of where it would make sense to distinguish currencies. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> so there was also one clever question for the consumer. There's two types of money, right? There's cash, the paper money, and there's the digital central bank money when this would happen, or he has the deposits with UBS, right? Right. And there was a question, shouldn't there be an exchange rate in between these two? Between uh, cash and yes. uh, CBDC or between... Right. Well, let's say cash and CBDC, right. So then the central bank has some more policy parameters, right? Yes. In principle, you could think about this. Um, in the world that if you just want to replicate the equivalent arrangement that we have today, then you wouldn't need that. Because yes, today, maybe for some crisis reasons, you might want to have it. So, in the so, the first step, if you want to just uh, you know, conserve the status quo, then you could have a fixed exchange rate between CBDC, cash, and deposits, as we have it today, essentially, well, right? <clears throat> then the next question would be, you know, but maybe I don't would uh, maybe I wouldn't like these huge swings that people withdraw from UBS and suddenly want to deposit lots of amounts of CBDC at the Swiss National Bank. And to avoid this, some people argue one should either ration that, so one should say, you know, you're not allowed to transfer more than X to, to your SMB account, or some other people argue, well, maybe we should then have an exchange rate, right? You know, you could still get cash at some price, but maybe if you want to have to, uh, CBDC, it would be more expensive or something to discourage these flows. These are things that I don't think you need to do. You would need to do them if you don't want to have this totally equivalent arrangement that I was talking about. And if you really want to discourage these flows, I think there's no need, theoretically at least, to discourage these huge flows if, they, if people want them. But certainly the exchange rate between all these three asset classes is in principle something that is, you know, a policy parameter that, that, that policymakers could play with. Um, a very dangerous policy parameter though, right? But, but in principle, yes, yeah. And there was a simple question. You mentioned this paper by Brunnermeyer, rethinking the currency competition. Yeah. But could, could be more precise, how can the people find it? Oh, um, I think if you search for Marcus Brunnemeyer, Harold James, and I think the third author was Jean-Pierre Landau, L-A-N-D-A-U, then you find only one paper that was issued last year. It is some <clears throat> NBR working paper. And I think with these three names, you will, you will find it. Let me just type the names in the chat and then you will, I think okay. you will find them. So Bruno Meyer, Lando, and James, I think. So there's one aspect in, okay, Bruno Meyer, Lando, James, thank you. So there's one aspect which typically people forget about currencies, which is identification. So sometimes you would like to have a 
common currency because people want to identify with a nation. If you remember East Germany and West Germany, the Eastern Germans, they said, if the Deutschmark doesn't come to us, we go to her, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's a matter of identification. Mm -hmm. so that's psychologically very important that if you want to form a nation, you want to identify yeah, yeah. with a greenback or with a euro or with whatever currency, right? I agree. Certainly in Switzerland, I'm not sure whether this is true in Zimbabwe, but in Switzerland, it's true, I think. Yeah. Right. It's a matter of identification, right? That you are part of the country because you have the same currency. Yeah. So that's one reason for the euro, even though from the optimal currency area, if you look at all the macroeconomics, maybe it's not a good idea. But yeah. The identification argument, right? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Right. So we have so many, so many questions. <laughs> I, I get totally busy here. The, oh, yes, so now is a question to smart contracts, whether you can use smart contracts to <clears throat> impose negative interest rates when you have central bank digital currencies. So people are afraid maybe as long as you have a lot of cash, you can avoid too high negative interest rates. And when the cash is gone, like Rogoff is saying, you can have negative 10, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I think it has nothing to do. I mean, this, this option is not related to, uh, to smart contracts or not. It's really the critical question is, do you abolish cash or not? And I, I'm, that's why I'm very, I'm, I'm very skeptical to this idea of abolishing cash. Um, uh, I think it's it's not a good idea. Um, uh, there are some central banks. In, in my view, it's a bit counterintuitive. They are actually thinking about CBDC because they want to get more robustness in the financial system. They think about you know how could we maintain the payment system in times of crisis, uh, even in times of war. And then they argue we should have CBDC, but they don't really care about cash. In my view, that's a bit uh, schizophrenic. I mean, I mean, the most robust payment system that we have or means of payment that we have is cash. I mean, if you have a pandemic, it might be infected, but you can still use a glove or something. But if the, if, if the servers break down, if you don't have electricity, if you don't have a connection to the internet, uh, cash typically works. So I think it's a very robust means of payment and it would be uh, I, I don't see good reasons to abolish it. Just to be able to have minus 10% interest rate, uh, I think you should find some other ways to, to get your macroeconomic objectives rather than uh, having 10% interest rates. Right. But one yeah. aspect that is super important when it comes to smart contracts is, is also <clears throat> a very old macroeconomic debate. I mean, the big problem with monetary uh, policy is that in the short term, uh, governments and central banks always have an incentive to, to cheat, let me say, just to cheat, so to, to deviate from what is uh, the long-term optimal monetary policy. In some sense, the optimal monetary policy is one which is super boring. You want to be very, um, uh, very, uh, very easy to, I mean, people should understand very well what you're going to do. There should be no big surprises. Everything should be really calm and boring. But in the short term, once people believe that you will behave like this, the government or the central bank always has an incentive to deviate from that, to do something different, because then it can generate some real effects in the economy, which like you know, boost, boost output and, and these kind of things. But with a smart contract, in principle, you could do what Friedman, a super famous um, macroeconomist like 50 years ago, actually argued. He said what the monetary policy should be like is simply that you say every year I will increase the quantity of money by say 3% and I will do nothing but this. Now this is probably not a very smart monetary policy but that's what he favored at least at some point. And with a smart contract, you could do something like this, right? You could actually, you could actually be much smarter. You could say, if nothing happens then we will increase money by 3% but if you know we have a corona crisis and maybe it should be 12% and, and et cetera. The point is you could, you could um, you could separate the actual monetary policy implementation from human interference. And therefore you could uh, avoid these time inconsistency problems which plague monetary economics and monetary policy. But this is very, I think it's very esoteric and to have such a smart contract, you really would need a super smart contract. And I doubt that we would be able to write such a smart contract because we simply don't know what will happen tomorrow and we don't understand all these contingencies and we don't know 
already today what the optimal monetary policy would be like in those contingencies. But at least as a thought experiment, uh, these smart contracts would give you what we call commitment, which is a, a useful thing to have. All right. There was a simple question. The Bank of England is asking for proposals on CBDC or consultants on CBDC. And there was a question whether you're engaged in this Bank of England initiative. No. No. Okay, that's a simple answer to a simple <laughs> question. <laughs> the, the other question was when you have a CBDC, does this need some sort of backing like gold or whatever? Or should it be like these days that's backed in promises and trust? Or should there be GDP or a basket of other currencies? So, so does it need some, some backing? Mm -hmm. I think that's a, that's a very deep question. <clears throat> And uh, in <laughs> economics, we, are, we have been struggling with the question you know, why money has value for forever. And I don't think we have the final or good answers. But, but I think what I, what I can say is that I don't think you need everything different from what we have today, right? It's not clear how the Swiss franc today is backed. Of course, the Swiss National Bank has some assets and it actually has an equity position. So it's in a sense, the Swiss banks are, are fully backed by these assets. Um, but you can also think in the current system of central banks that have negative equity. There's many central banks who had negative equity or who currently have negative equity. This is something that could work. In, in economics, we talk about such a situation as the money being essentially a bubble Well, it's always in some sense, it's a bubble in the sense that it's, it just has value because I believe that I will find somebody tomorrow who will accept it from me. I don't need that to be, have, to have a fundamental value in the sense that it pays some interest or something. It's sufficient that I believe that somebody else will accept it tomorrow from me. And this person tomorrow will accept it from me because she again will think that she will have somebody the day after tomorrow who will accept it from her. So that's what in economics we call a bubble. And this is perfectly fine. So maybe today some currencies are bubbles and then the CBDC could also be a bubble. Maybe they are not. And then CBDC would also be not. There's no difference, I think, in terms of backing to the current situation. Okay, there was a regulatory question also. Would CBDC facilitate the life of FINMA? Because they have to <clears throat> regulate the banks and check all the accounts. So would this make it easier for FINMA? Um, well, maybe FINMA would then have to check the SMB accounts, right? Or some <laughs> probably, I mean, it's, it's very likely in my view that if there's something like CBDC, then uh, all these kind of um, know your customer and, and uh, protect against this, protect against that um, regulation would certainly also apply to CBDC, right? The government would not make it easier for uh, drug dealers or criminals or whoever to, to transact using CBDC than using UBS deposits. So the same, the same amount of work would have to be done, whether this would be FINMA or whether the, some other authority would be in charge of this, I don't know. But I don't think there would be less know your customer work to do. There could be less FINMA work in the sense of um, financial stability, right? Both SNB and FINMA work in terms of financial stability, because as I argued before, and as you pointed out, Torsten, um, if the SNB were a large creditor of the banking sector, they would know the banks through that channel. They would be able to um, internalize some externalities, so they would <coughs> be able to avoid some really bad outcomes. And uh, from that domain, uh, we would maybe need less additional regulation. We also would have um, less need for regulation uh, that arises because we have all these too, too big to fail um, safety systems in place. Because we know that we have to rescue banks today ex post, I mean, maybe not, but maybe we still have to, uh, because we know that this might happen we regulate banks and supervise banks ex ante very much in order to at least you know, you know, check all these potential moral hazard problems. And once we have less of these too big to fail problems in the future, less of these risks of too big to fail, then we would need less ex ante regulation and supervision in the first place. So there could really be some net reduction in supervisory activity on that side, yes. Okay. 
And there was one question, when we have CBDC, how would the companies get money directly from the central bank? So the central bank has to do all the screening and all the difficult work on the balance sheet of the companies or only indirectly via the commercial banks? Mm -hmm. That's a very important question. And the answer is the SMB would not be involved at all in extending credit to the real economy, right? Because whatever they gain in funding by issuing CBDC, they would rechannel to the banks. And all the, all the sort of the important decisions, you know, should this guy get a credit, should this guy get a mortgage, blah, 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 this would still be happening on the side of the banks exactly in the same way as it uh, is happening today. The only thing that would change for the banks is that they would get funding uh, to the extent that people adopt CBDC, they would get this differential amount they would now get from the central bank rather than from the depositors. But whatever is happening on the asset side of the commercial bank's balance sheet would still be exactly the same as before. Okay, <clears throat> so I guess I have raised all questions. So if I forgot some question, you have to retype it. So. Yeah, and otherwise, uh, feel free to uh, email me questions if there's somebody. There were a couple okay. of questions in the chat, not in the Q and A part. <clears throat> okay, now it's in the chat. Okay. That's <laughs> okay, we have had this. Oops. <clears throat> so there was some, some question, but I don't know where it appeared. Yeah. Well, there was a comment by Yun Lin Liu who says yes. that the CBDC issued by the People's Bank of China could preserve privacy users. It was a comment only. Users could make payments with their own phones. No internet or bank accounts are needed in that case. Then um, a question that was by Nia. Did you ask this question about the commodity, the equivalence between digital assets for any commodity? No. Thorsten? This was a question to me or to Dirk? No, to I'm asking you if you ask <laughs> this question. Uh, who will decide the equivalent digital assets for any commodity? And transaction using digital assets will become almost the same as barter uh, systems of all time. This is what Nia says. Yeah. Uh, so so I, I, I didn't fully understand, but if you can, you can so it, it, the barter thing, I think we, talk, we talked a bit about barter before, right? If everything is liquid, then you don't need money anymore. You can directly exchange everything against everything. Yeah, the question was how these digital assets would be priced in such a way that you eventually are able to trade any commodity. This was the, the logic of the question. I see. How would they be priced? Well, I mean, I mean, I'm a theory guy, so don't ask me about the real world. How would I think about a barter economy to work? So, I mean, um, there, is some, there is some platform on which people submit bids and asks, and then, you know, there's some market clearing price that is, that is some, mm -hmm. some algorithm that figures out which, which um, price maximizes trade, essentially, right? That's one mm -hmm. way to do it. Or maybe you have some auction system. Um, there's different ways to, to determine quantity and price. Um, yeah. Yeah. And there was another question that is, which is your opinion regarding this actually CBDC that's going to be issued by China, China and how this is going to affect the global monetary system? So I vis -a -vis the competition between China, US yes. or some yeah. other countries, who is yeah. the first to do it? Yeah. I think there, I think there is a significant first mover advantage here. So, and, and um, I mean, China has been putting a lot of pressure on developing countries, right? Wherever they invest, they, they make sure that um, those countries are also buying Chinese or, or selling land to China, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I'm, I'm sure that China will, will make sure that these countries will more and more use the, the renminbi currency. 
-hmm. and then try to because as a country you have an advantage if you can issue currency because it's like a it's a, it's an additional source of revenue you can issue your currency at an interest rate which is lower than if you issue government debt the difference between the interest rate that you have to pay on government debt that you issue and the interest rate that you have to pay on the money that you issue which often is zero is like a government revenue it's called seniorage mm -hmm. and so therefore governments have an incentive to issue money it's it's a great deal if you can do this the U.S. Um, benefits a lot from that, that everybody's using dollars. And um, so the U.S. has a really big incentive to avoid that people start to using uh, Chinese currency for, for trade or international finance. Mm -hmm. And every country has this incentive to some extent. Yeah. I think that also this answers the question by Rebecca Perro. Mm -hmm. Good. <clears throat> Good. I think we are running out of questions, right? Yes. And the backer says thank you, so we are fine. <laughs> yeah. And so I, exactly. So I wanted to thank you, Dirk, for uh, this very interesting deep and what something very remarkable that was also a very accessible presentation. So thank you for this and for participating in this uh, lecture today, Thorsten, for managing the session. But also the we had more than one hundred. Uh, 10 participants today. So thank you for joining in this digital means in this new format. Uh, and finally, and on behalf of the Blockchain Center of the University of Zurich, I want to thank Trust Square and the Centrum that helped us with the organization of this event. And we will look forward for more uh, lectures in this lecture series. Okay, thank you very much. And as I said, if, 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 anybody, if anybody wants to uh, email me, feel free to email me. I'm happy to discuss more if you have interest in CBDC. Thanks very much for having me and yes, thank you for coming. Stay healthy. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.